Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the AltMed podcast. Andrew Dowling here with me as always, my trusty co-host, Mitch Kurtz. Uh, we've been indeed. talking about uh, whiskey for a little while. Actually, uh, needed to remind him that we do do an alternative medicine podcast. But um, I guess depending on what kind of day you've had, maybe a, a nice peaty whiskey <laughs> is in order, which is a really nice segue to uh, introduce our guest. We are absolutely thrilled to have. Um, I know Mitch has been uh, laboring trying to uh, to set this up for a little while, so it's it's finally happening. We are. So pleased to have Dr. Brian Walker, um, who is in the upper, for those who don't know uh, Dr. Walker um, or Brian, uh, he works in the upper house of the Western Australian um, Legislative Council in Parliament and represents the Legalised Cannabis Party. So Brian, welcome to the show. It's absolutely our privilege to have you. It's a pleasure to be here, Andrew. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we, I think the... Um, the tone of today will definitely be skirting around uh, legal reform in the in the space of, of um, medical and, and re possibly recreational cannabis use in Australia. But before we go there, you were a doctor. I, I only read a, a snippet about your life before Parliament, but it sounds like you've practiced in a, a few countries. Can you maybe give us a, an overview of how you got to where you are? Well, I left uh, Australia when I was 16 uh, because I was going to volunteer for Vietnam, stupid. Ended up in Scotland, my parents' home. I went to medical school there. Uh, left as soon as I could, became a doctor in Germany, then in the Soviet Union, uh, then in Scotland where my accent changed from German to Russian to Scottish again, then in <laughs> China, Hong Kong. And then in 2008, my wife says, it's about time you settle down. So I came back to Australia. Oh my goodness. And That's, here uh, I've practiced, um, and I'm not very good in metropolitan medicine, uh, so I was uh, the locuming around uh, upcountry, uh, Halls Creek, Fitzroy Crossing, uh, Broome, uh, Newman, as well as Tasmania and a bit in Queensland, and then settled in the wheat belt here, and then I'm now part-time actually uh, in the, the, my electorate actually, East Metropolitan, uh, where I have a, a, a part-time general practice. That is an unbelievable story. I mean, I dare say you're the first parliamentarian in WA that has uh, done a GP world tour. Um, that's, uh, <laughs> seriously. Well, did you know that I'm the first doctor in the upper house of WA since 1971? Goodness me. So I, all the laws yeah. we've had there, not one single doctor in the upper house has reviewed them. That is just extraordinary. I do actually re remember not too long ago seeing a little snippet of you uh, in action on your feet in Parliament uh, on, on Twitter, and I think you were lamenting um, all of the additional paperwork that has to be done by GPs. I'm, I was actually at the time thinking, I wonder how often it is that these people assembled in this room actually hear from a doctor about, you know, what it's, what it's like. And it's, I think we hear a lot these days about, uh, you know, people who are kind of career politicians, um, you know, the, whatever that term might mean. But the idea being that perhaps people lack sufficient life experience before they enter the door of parliament to work. And I, I think you're, um, yeah, well and truly the antithesis of a career <laughs> politician. <laughs> Well, that is true, although I am making it my career because I'm passionate about this. People ask me, why did I leave medicine? I haven't left. Why did I go into politics? And the answer is quite simply anger. The amount of, of injustice I see as a doctor with my patients that I can't influence in any shape or wise. Uh, and so coming into, into politics, I'm able to have at least some influence on the levers of power there and uh, make some changes. Because when people say, oh, we spent $300 million on, on psychiatrists and psychologists, I'm saying, guys, at the front end, and I'm at the front end, we're not seeing that. It's not mm -hmm. a problem of lack of psychiatrists. It's the social situations which are causing people mental health problems in the first place. Fix those, and everything else becomes much cheaper. Mm. Well, this was, um, it's an interesting point, because I know, well, Victoria did a, a fairly large scale Royal Commission recently into um, its mental health system. But the terms of reference, if I recall, didn't actually include anything that perhaps related to how people, you know, necessarily become mentally unwell, or, you know, what societal factors might, might cause that, nor indeed do I recall it, it touching on 
um, alternative medicines like psychedelic medicines, which are mm. only available under clinical trials. So the even, in, and that was maybe a few years ago, but even just in the last few years, this um, conversation around the use of alternative medicine is really, really picking up. Um, yeah. It's exciting. Uh, I'm hoping that the TGA is going to downregulate uh, MDMA and psilocybin from S9 to S8. I really hope so, mm. because the treatment for PTSD, the classical treatment we can give, we zombify people. Every two weeks, uh, one of our vets is killing themselves with PTSD. That's just the vets. Yeah. Uh, we have eight or nine suicides a day in Australia. And um, uh, the, the, after 10 years, maybe 5% of the survivors are feeling, yeah, okay, the rest are not. They're not mm. contributing to society, they're not well, they're just hanging on by the skin of their teeth. Whereas MDMA with one course of, of, of uh, psychotherapy, uh, specialized psychology, uh, gives you a 50% immediate cure rate. Mm. Cure. Mm. And in six months, it's 85% cure. Astronomical mm. improvement. And you mm. have to ask yourself, why is it that our politicians don't have the courage to actually let this be free? What's the damage that can be caused? A lot less than the medications I can prescribe for PTSD. A lot less. So what, what, what is the reason, do you think? Why aren't politicians supporting this? It, do you think it has something to do with your understanding at a clinical level? Or is, it, is it there another conversation to be had here? Well, look, I mean, it's, it depends on how you use the word illicit. Because in Saudi Arabia, alcohol is illicit. Here mm. it's not. So mm. it depends on the government of the time, which de de decides, is this going to be allowed or not? And the, the drugs that are currently called illicit, uh, when you take them, you're now a criminal. Mm. And it's not because they're bad. It's because the government has said, you shall not use these. Why? And it's a, a long story for that. But basically, the, the, if it's abused, bad things can happen. By all means, you use alcohol the wrong way bad things happen. In the Kimberley, for example, 60% of the children are born with fetal alcohol syndrome. Mm, mm. 60%, massive problems. Now, um, if you then look at MDMA and the damage it can cause, compare it to alcohol, it's minimal. Mm. Alcohol is the biggest problem and death and destruction in society. MDMA is minimal. Cannabis is a little bit worse, but not much. Mm. Uh, it's psilocybin, minimal. Uh, the side effects of that are almost zero. So the, the benefits for, say, psilocybin and depression are huge. Mm. Uh, so you can get much better outcomes using natural medicines than you can with the artificial ones, which either don't work or they have side effects. For example, did you know that the majority of people in America who've taken weapons and um, uh, done mass uh, shootings, a majority of those have been taking SSRI antidepressants, which as a side effect makes you aggressive. Mm. Mm. And we allow this. We think no problem with that. But MDMA? No, it's dangerous. It's not. Mm. And the reason that politicians don't do this is A, they're not educated and B, they haven't got the courage because they think if we're perceived to be soft on drugs, we'll lose votes. Mm. It's not about science. It's not about facts. It's about the perception which makes me lose votes. Therefore, I lose power. I'm not going to have it. But I guess, aren't you kind of throwing that narrative on its head? I mean, look what you guys have just done in, in the previous, in the recent election. I mean, if that was true, you would not have done nearly as well as, as, as you really did. Well, the politicians, when I put it into the parliament here, for example, that we should get back to what the Labour Party did in 2003, and they re-supported that in 2019, we should have decriminalised two plants you can grow in your garden, you can have 25 grams, no one's going to question that, Okay. Rather than agreeing with their own policy, they went back to the Colin Barnett policy of anti-drug and not having any of this at all. So they actually supported the Liberal Party policies of stopping all drugs. Hmm. And uh, why? Because it's, it's in your party policy. Why don't you support it? Well, because the, the, the top people in the party don't want it. That's why. Hmm. Yeah. It's also and then you look at the figures, about hmm. half of them have tried cannabis themselves, but don't yeah. admit it. No. And then that, that's the, um, there's, there's so much going on there, but one of the things that's striking to me is I think, you know, certain um, groups that were established and, and by and funded by government to conduct drug and alcohol research since the 1990s have been coming to these conclusions where they look at the harm profile of, of other substances, so-called illicit substances as compared with alcohol. And it's, you know, clear to your point, that it just has such an incredibly low uh, harm profile, MDMA, psilocybin. And so, you know, the, what's the point in having, um, you know, what, what's the point in funding 
research if you're not actually going to accept its findings it's the, the first observation i just, actually if you have a thought on that i'd well, we've got an example here, the Wayne Martin report. There's a law here regarding criminal confiscation and, and uh, uh, managing uh, uh, drug uh, uh, crime. And you could lose your property if you're declared a, a, a drug trafficker. The drug trafficker part there it could be two plants, but they wear it with the soil. They say, now you're, you're, you're guilty of trafficking. So now your house can be a, the, the proceeds of crime and it's confiscated. How, un, what injustice do you have there? I mean, you've got two plants, you're treating yourself, and now you can lose your house for that. Guys, really? Yeah. So who's benefiting from it? Well, the police are benefiting from it. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, do you support, um, it, is it just the two plant kind of personal use situation you support, or is it more widely than that? Are, are you, would you have a, a totally recreational kind of uh, situation more akin to, say, Canada or, or potentially even though it's not federally legal in America, but it feels yes. like that when you're there. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, um, it's a doable st uh, stage. It's a phase. If we decriminalize for a small amount, it's the one part. And this is probably why the government doesn't want it, because they know it's the thin edge of the wedge and the rest will follow on. Um, I personally think that we ought to be free to use a healthy healing herb. Now, you might then say, but it could be dangerous. And the answer is yes, it could be. If you're going to give high THC to growing brains, you can cause problems. Yes, you can. It's a little bit like giving alcohol to six-year-olds. Don't do it. You know, even 18, you could say, it's still a growing brain. Maybe we should put that 21. That's not going to happen. But at 18, well, there's reasonable responsibility and reasonable brain uh, uh, control. Now, the, if we were to treat cannabis the same way, that under 18, uh, you shouldn't be uh, having access to it, we can control that. We can legislate for that. So it's a, it's a drug which is under, because it's now open and allowed, we can actually regulate how it's used. Yes, you're going to find people who abuse it, the people who give alcohol to their 14 year old children, by all means. But it's a lot less than having it freely available as an illicit substance that you can take when you're a six year old because you've been bullied at school. Mm. And, and arguably, there are potential upsides, at least in therapeutic application for sub 18 year olds, um, even with small amounts of THC, um, depending on, on their uh, indication. So I think, yeah, it's interesting thinking about it from that illicit mindset you were talking about earlier. I mean, it's really, as you said, the government of the day, and we're, we're seeing that we were just discussing before in, in Thailand, which was announced uh, today, that, uh, yeah, they're, they're pretty much opening up completely. It's going to be free reign, it looks like, in um, over in old Thailand, which is, uh, yeah, a far cry from what it used to be and definitely a far cry from the juxtaposition of what's happened uh, <laughs> right next door or almost well, it's, next door. It's, it's, one of the good news stories out of Thailand is that there are approximately 4,000 people who are currently incarcerated on cannabis related um, offenses and, and convictions. And all of those people are likely going to be set free on Thursday. So, you know, quite, um, quite extraordinary. I'm sure, um, you know, no one really over there needs to be locking their front door. You know, there's crazy hordes of people coming mm. from the jail who once possessed three grams of, of cannabis flour. I mean, it, it is when you when you break it down, it's, it is just truly crazy that this suddenly is the outlier country in, in Asia. But it is actually now leaps and bounds ahead of where Australia is. Um, oh, huge. Mm. Uh, it must be said that probably the cannabis is going to be fairly low THC cannabis. And I have to say that the, the modern trend for high THC strains is probably not good. The balance of one to one, uh, the CBD will counteract the THC and you get actually a very different uh, uh, um, uh, range yes, yes. Of, of effects. Mm. And that's probably healthy for you. The high THC to get people stoned. It really, do we really want to do that? Do we want every time to take alcohol? Do we want to get drunk? No, we want to enjoy a glass of wine, for example, or a, or a shot of whiskey with friends, with a bit of cheese, watching the game or whatever. Uh, and this is the way that we should be treating recreational cannabis as something which sensible people use sensibly. Are mm. there going to be people who want to get stoned all the time? Yes, there are. Is it going to be our problem? It shouldn't be. Does it make people sick? Yes, it might well do if you take an overdose. But then again, that happens with many things. Uh, overdose of food, overdose of sugar, overdose mm. of, of sex can, can, can cause problems. But we have to be, uh, allow ourselves some personal autonomy. Mm. Grown people can make their own decisions. If you want to do stupid things, do it. Just don't hurt anyone else.
yes yeah, that's true and i was i i guess the counter argument that you might hear to that is like yes we we do want a beer with lunch we do want a, a glass of wine with dinner something like that but you only need to spend a weekend on Chapel Street or at the footy to to know that we inherited our genes from you you, you uh, UK types and um, you know that that kind of borderline between uh, responsible use we we like to push that boundary down here um, so I, I guess that would be the counter argument but but to that I, I guess I would say even in that scenario um, cannabis as a harm profile as opposed to having 10 shots of whiskey, let's say, versus, you know, 10 hits on the, on the vape. Um, I, I can't see it having that same uh, negative outcome. You're not it, getting it your stomach pumped. For, you know. It doesn't. For example, if you can go out, I always say to my patients, you watch out, the third beer is where the problems start. Mm. The first two beers, fine. The third beer, that's when shit happens. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> now, in, but in cannabis, if you're taking, if you, now, I think smoking cannabis is the most unhealthy way of taking it. Uh, but if that's what you want to do, by all means. But generally, what we find is that people who are smoking cannabis or vaping cannabis are generally going to say they'll take a hit, uh, take maybe a second one. They're in a mellow state there and they're just chilling after that. They're not taking any more. Mm. Uh, as in alcohol, by the third beer, you have to have a fourth, why not a fifth? And then, of course, the game starts. And then, of course, you're really on a, on a, on a run. That mm. doesn't happen with cannabis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of times where you've you've just gone out for, for one beer and it ends up being five. Um, Don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm talking as Andrew here. I, I, I wouldn't know either. But, but you know, I see, I see him with this problem. Um, <laughs> we've all been there. We've all and we've all regretted it. Uh, but just why alcohol is so much more dangerous than cannabis? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and yeah. The, to your point as well earlier, Mitch. Uh, yeah, people actually on a you know you go to an emergency department on a Friday or a Saturday night, you're gonna see people getting their stomachs pumped. Uh, you know what's the worst thing that could happen with somebody taking too much cannabis? They might just need to uh, go and lie down. Um, you know, gather their thoughts. They might be you know, dazed and confused halfway to somewhere that sells ice cream. I'm not entirely sure where, but, um, <laughs> but uh, no, it's, yeah. So anyway, there's, um, there's lots to, to unpack here, but I, I am interested in if, if we can stray the conversation for a moment into just talking about the, um, the legalized cannabis political party, how did that sort of come about? Because not only is it yourself, but your um, colleague, Sophia, um, also was elected so we have you are you one year down into a, a four year, one year down. term yeah so there's three at least three very exciting years ahead but you know, obviously if there are any wa listeners to this podcast please cast your votes for uh, for brian and sophia at the next election um but of course it's your vote you have autonomy to choose whoever you want um <laughs> but uh can you talk to us about your political party the genesis of it and yeah, what your your hopes and, and aims are. There is a movement afoot throughout the world and also in Australia that the current laws regarding cannabis are stupid. Mm -hmm. they're, they're simply stupid. And so people have got together and they have decided that they're going to band together as political parties that we've only recently um, they got unified. I mean, I think Queens, uh, Queensland basically set WA on the right path. And our election was thrown together very quickly uh, with, with the uh, executive, they did an excellent job. And we, we got two members. Now you could say, well, it's preference harvesting. We didn't, uh, it was just the way things fell. We had some luck, it must be said. But hmm. the feedback we're getting now, you saw with the recent uh, federal elections, people are saying, oh, hang about, this makes eminent sense. And uh, there's a federal body now, and they're working as, as a unit throughout Australia uh, to get all of the states and territories working on the same page, if you like. Because what we need to do is, first of all, uh, put forward this uh, concept that cannabis is not dangerous. It's not a dangerous drug. It's uh, been banned for, for a, very stupid, well, a very stupid series of reasons. If our laws are created in such a way that this stupidity is perpetuated, what other laws are stupid? Mm. For example, uh, what about our homelessness? If we actually paid for every homeless person to have a home, the costs of doing that are less than treating the costs of homelessness. Mm. Why don't we do that? Mm. If you look at, for example, using hemp as a substance which is going to help with sustainable environment, uh, improving the topsoil, giving better yields to farmers, but we're not doing it because we're frightened of THC might get into the system. 
And as a result, our topsoil is eroding, our farms are losing their value, desertification of the farms. This is stupid. Why do we do that? If we have got a business which is a multi-billion dollar potential, which could balance the iron ore trade in Western Australia alone and make herself sustainable and independent of foreign countries like China, why are we not doing it? Mm. The water resources we could be using to, to make hemp um, um, a, a useful product for building cars, planes, boats, all the fibers we want, dust suppression measures, pet bedding, um, uh, the houses which uh, survive bushfires and can keep you safe in a, as a refuge during a bushfire. These things are all available to us if we just get our finger out and ignore the fact that THC might cause problems in a small amount of cases, but it's not a big thing. Mm. I guess we could start with the, the topsoil of lettuce farms at the moment, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be a way to win the hearts of, of all Australians missing their salad, um, because that's quite a topical issue. But no, it's it's very true. It's very true. The hempcrete one is a particular interest to me. I think when I haven't heard about it um, being used in, in a bushfire sense, but that's uh, that's a very appealing one, I think, um, especially to, to people like Andrew, who grew up in bushfire <laughs> regions well, well it hasn't yeah. been properly tested yet because they haven't got their idea around the fact that when you put fire to a, to a hempcrete block it doesn't burn it doesn't get damaged it also insulates if you build a, a hempcrete house in winter it doesn't need heating in summer it doesn't need cooling mm -hmm. so it's it's it's, uh, it's insulating uh, yeah. would a bushfire passing over that would it cause damage well we don't know it hasn't been tested but it's highly likely what about if we built beside your house, an ordinary house, just a hempcrete a shelter where you and your family and your pets could take shelter? If you've protected your house and it's failed, take shelter there. Would it keep you alive? Very likely. Why don't we test it? Oh, because there may be cannabis there. Uh, let's get our act together. Um, there, there's so many things we could do. There's so much benefits to the people of Australia. Mm. And withholding ourselves from this is just stupidity. And that's one reason from the political point of view why we want to get out there. It's not just about smoking cannabis. It's about using cannabis medicinally properly as a recreation, um, the, the recreational use far safer than alcohol. Um, and as a, as, a, as a product can help in uh, agriculture, can help our economy, can help um, uh, just protect our peoples from, from the stresses of, of, of life. I can't think of any bad thing happening, except for those few cases where if you overdose on THC at a young age, you might cause something like a, a psychosis, which, by the way, is not definite. It might be uh, simply accidental that we've got this conjunction between the two, although I, I, I do think there are cases of psychosis in young people with exposure to high THC at a young age. Mm. Yeah, mm. and it's, it's, it's fascinating, too, because, you know, the... I guess the use of hemp and, and of cannabis, it, it, it's it, it, historically, I mean, we're really just looking at, the, at a blackout period that sort of kicked off in the 20th century. But I was looking, uh, somebody posted this fascinating tweet actually the other day, which was of a early 20th century $10 US banknote. And you can see yes. in the picture, the hemp that's being used in the on the farm. So, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words as they say and you know even uh, I was in Amsterdam actually a couple of months ago and wandered through the um, the hemp museum in the middle of town and they they're very proud of the the rich history that hemp played as a, as a textile uh, in their shipping trade so all of the yes. you know the masts the ropes that were all used on those old trading ships all um, using hemp textiles so we're, we're in this strange thing where it's it's almost I, I look at your political party almost as though, you know, somebody were starting a party, you know, at the beginning of when Australia was settled called the <laughs> Legalise Alcohol Party or something. Yes. It's just such an accepted part of life. But you know that Joseph Banks insisted that hemp be brought out in every ship? Yes, I have. Okay. I and the, 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 from the political side here, it's not, it's not really, um, well, it is to a large degree about cannabis and hemp. But actually, what I'm looking to do here is to, uh, is to be an antidote to the left-right violence. Uh, I'm right, no, I'm right, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, uh, this mm -hmm. type of... And they change their point of view, depending... I've been elected, this is my point of view. Well, now you're elected, I've got the opposite point of view. Mm 
And you think, that's stupid. Yes, uh, whereas yes. I want to capture the, the middle of Australia, this extremes of left and right, do what you like. But yeah. I want to have the middle of Australia, those who want common sense policies, who want to just live normal lives. The, the, the 58% support the idea of decriminalizing or legalizing cannabis, but they also want to have safe housing. They want to have jobs. They want to have economic security. So all these policies is part of what I would like to put in to uh, the, the, the middle of Australia as the sensible party to choose, because this left-right um, uh, the oppositional nature is just detrimental to every aspect of our lives. Well, what's it? I have to ask a, a few questions just about, um, I guess, the, the situation in, in WA and, and, of course, I've you know, everyone's talking about the the great reset that happened in um, in the, the federal parliament, but there was a quite significant reset. I mean, it, it, it amuses me to some extent that you have the same number of legalized cannabis people in the upper house as we do liberal um, representatives in the lower house. Um, apologies to, to Zach Kirkup for that one. But um, yeah, I uh, no, it was just interesting last year to see that that huge landslide in the lower house what is the sort of the current state of play in the upper house is it still is it quite um is it quite a split chamber or would you say that you know it's well there, you have quite a lot of support there what, what's the circumstance well in the upper house uh first of all you've got a huge majority of labor in both the lower house and the upper house right so the the, the problem with that is that the upper house is a house of review mm. and we're not allowed to review the lower house legislation because the upper house labor members just pass it through and they say it's democratic we voted we, we win yeah so of all of the laws which have been enacted since uh, the last election there's only been one very small very minor amendment that was i think a, a change of a date okay to all of the bills which basically says that the laws that we have written have been perfect <laughs> right and of all the laws, I'm on the legislation committee as well, not one single bill has been put to the legislation committee for review because the laws they put through are all perfect. This is uh, patent nonsense. Yes. But because we've got an over a preponderance of labor, we can't get any, uh, any traction. We can't get any bipartisan discussions. It's all labor wins. And uh, uh, so I'm often finding myself on the opposite side of, of the labor. Not, I'm actually often aligned with the general tenets of labor, but I, I don't like this, the whole bill. There's issues there, which I, I don't agree with. Therefore, I've got to vote against it. So it appears as if I'm actually on the liberal side. I'm not, mm. okay? I'm actually very firmly on the crossbench. Well, uh, yeah, I've only got four yeah. crossbench members. Mm. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's actually, it reminds me of, um, I think after the 2004 federal election, John Howard had an absolute majority in both houses. Mm. And his undoing, um, if anyone remembers, was the work choices, industrial um, legislation reform. And I, I, I guess the, I, I only say that because, you know, be careful what you wish for McGowan. I mean, it, once you have that degree of power that you can pass whatever you like, I mean, I, I already, from, from what we um, read here, I, I get the sense that his popularity is perhaps, has perhaps declined somewhat since that that election. So it will be interesting to see what happens um, for the remaining term. But what, what's on your legislative agenda for the next three years? What do you and Sophia hope to do? Well, first of all, um, I have my select committee, which is looking at the cannabis and hemp uh, with uh, for, for medicinal use and also for industrial hemp uh, for nutraceutical human and animal use. Mm. And uh, one of the now, I can't speak to the committee because it's all behind closed doors until it's published. But uh, my hope is that we're going to see that, first of all, the, these, um, these um, uh, THC driving laws are going to change. Mm. The police commissioner has already agreed that they're not testing for uh, impairment. They're testing for presence. And the law states that impairment, so the presence of THC is equivalent to impairment. And that's a blatant lie. Yeah. It's just not true. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping very much that we're going to uh, have enacted in law that THC presence does not equal impairment. Therefore, 
all of these, uh, the THC uh, positive tests, the, the fines, the criminal convictions, the, uh, all these uh, things will be made um, uh, retrospective. They're just gone. Mm. Because imagine you've been prescribed by your doctor a THC, and then you've been found to, to have a THC positive test. And now you're a criminal. Now you can't go to America because you've got to declare you've been de declared a, a criminal because of drugs. But this is manifest injustice. Yeah. And everyone recognizes this, and that's one thing we want to change. The next thing is that we've got a, a bill we're proposing to put through Parliament, and that bill is going to be to permit uh, uh, plants, much like in the ACT, that we have a certain number of plants, a certain weight of cannabis uh, will be permitted, uh, decriminalized, if you like. And we've got an idea there of how to put cannabis out there, much like the, the Amsterdam uh, coffee shops. Uh, but also looking here at how we actually uh, make that happen using the existing alcohol laws uh, to distribute uh, 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 cannabis. So that, that's a bill we're proposing to put through. It will fail, but that's what we're proposing to put out there as a template, if you like, for people following on. Uh, every day in the chamber, we're actually um, using the word cannabis. It's being become normalized. So yes, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm putting this uh, out to all different aspects. For example, that Wayne Martin report, uh, getting justice there. Uh, we're bringing this up on a regular basis about the, the impropriety of, of the uh, criminal convictions for simply using cannabis for, for personal uh, medication. So these, these are just horrible things to happen, injustice. So we're pushing and pushing and pushing on, on getting the cannabis legalized, but first of all, maybe decriminalized. Now we know it's not going to work because we have the overwhelming preponderance of labor and indeed the liberals, they're all against this. Why? Anyone's guess, but uh, it's just not going to happen. But what I'm hoping for is that we're putting out this, and this is uh, really important, that we're putting out into the public, the concept that we have a professional uh, in, the, in the, the chamber. We have someone who's got economic sense, we've got social justice, we have got sensible ideas for uh, managing a serious problem in a serious manner as serious politicians, and that people will be listening to us and vote for us at the next state election. So the next state election is a one, um, it's one state uh, choice, not electorates, it's actually just one state. And we're hoping there to get a much increased vote, and we're very happy to, to think it's possible. And with other crossbench members coming, we're hoping then that will have a balance of power in the upper house where we can actually begin to effect serious change. So mm -hmm. that our, our, our aim is recognizing we've got not much chance in this parliament because of the, the numbers, but that we're looking towards the next parliament mm -hmm. and then what we're building now will come to fruition then. That, that is fantastic. And it, and it will be interesting as well that by the time that next election rolls around, I mean, the industry in another three years from now you're going to have, um, you know, even more being done, you know, from the sort of the leading industry players over there, you know, Canaponics, Little Green Pharma. There's a real industry that that is just, you know, kind of burgeoning at the moment. And that will only, I think, go from strength to strength. Um, I do love the idea of, of Western Australia sort of leading the charge because it, it sort of marries up to the American experience of the West Coast states, uh, you know, sort of going first. <laughs> but um but, uh, but no, so just on the, um, I guess the, the driving is an interesting one um, to take that first policy for a moment. So in Tasmania, I think if I'm not mistaken, Tasmania is the only state and their, their driving law effectively says something like, um, and, and I'm possibly going to mangle this, but my recollection is it, it, it says, you know, you cannot drive with cannabis in your system unless um, it was prescribed in accordance with the poison schedule or something like that. And so it's just a mm. carve out for prescription cannabis, but there's no, um, there, there's no, you know, I think sometimes people have this idea that there will be an equivalent blood alcohol um, limit threshold um, that is uh, imposed on cannabis. What kind of model would you like to see in WA? Would it be similar to, to that which is in, in place in Tasmania? Well, it's a start, but it's an imperfect start. Hmm. Um, so, so yes, but getting a, a, a measurable amount of THC and equivocating that to impairment, that's very difficult. Hmm. Um, the, the 0 0.05 we've got is basically been decided because at 0 0.05, on average, the number of accidents is double uh, the zero level. Hmm. So they said, okay, double the number, anything above that, you shouldn't be driving. Now, I know some people at 0 0.02 shouldn't be driving. It's very, very uh, specific. Uh, mm. to how you respond to alcohol. So it's, it's an imperfect measure, but look, it's a measure. 
we haven't got that measure for cannabis, but they're trying to find that. And that's an interesting one. And that's also a potential business development there. If you can get that uh, uh, set up, if you can get an IPO for that, the police might buy into that. It's quite a good business for them. Hmm. Uh, but at the moment, no. But what we have done is show that, first of all, for um, uh, CBD and all of the CBD uh, forms, there is no impairment at all. Mm. up to 1500 milligrams, zero impairment. From the THC point of view, we've got some varying uh, uh, results there, but they do show that after four hours, there is no impairment. So after four hours after intoxication, there is no impairment. And the impairment that is there is equivalent to being sleep impaired, mm. which means that what we need to be having is police officers on the road, not just testing for alcohol, but for the presence of impairment. Are mm. they doing that? They're not. Mm. And we can take this further to the work safe. People are being banned from work because they've got THC positive who are not impaired and they're letting in the next person through who is impaired, but they haven't detected it. And that person is liable for accidents and deaths. So are we happy with that? No, we're not. We should change this. This must be fixed. Yeah. I also, no, I think it's a great point because the remit of, of you know, what police and, and how um, traffic police officers tend to work is they rely on their instruments, whether that be a speed camera or a drug bus, um, you know, with, with the that thing you blow into when you get <laughs> yeah. alcohol tested. I don't breathalyzer. know. Breathalyzer, that's the one. Um, but it's, you never really see traffic officers actually just policing bad drivers and saying, you know, your lane change, I have to pull you over, that was terrible, are you impaired? And actually just... You know, conducting policing in that way, where we actually all, yep. you know, strive to to sort of weed out just bad drivers, and obviously somebody who is impaired. I mean, I I, I mentioned this um, in, a, in a previous episode, but I had some surgery last year and was prescribed Endone um, to manage the acute pain post surgery. And I just, while I was under the influence of, of those substances, I just uh, driving would be the last thing I would want to be doing, and yet perfectly legal to do um so yes. there really is that there's a, a serious you know yeah. injustice that needs to be addressed and fixed there when i think about you know those tests those impairment tests i get like this caricature of of american kind of cop shows where it's like get out and walk the line and like touch your rub your tummy and pat your head and I, it's just not something i think i've ever been asked to do in australia at least um yeah there is actually, a, I'm just looking at the test just now, Druid, D-R-U-I-D, is a, a test for impairment, which anyone can, can get. It's an app on your phone. Uh, and it's individualized, so the individual sets the parameters, and then you can check yourself against the, your, your previous uh, unimpaired uh, norms. Very mm. nice. And uh, so I'd, that's as possible we have that now. They could do that. It, it does take time, of course, which is probably the, the, the issue, that we haven't got the time to do this. Uh, but yes, you're, you're right. I mean, walk, walk a straight line. If, if you're like me, you've got one leg shorter than the other, that could be difficult at times. Hmm. You know, so uh, are you impaired? Well, no, I'm not. Uh, well, I'm physically impaired because of the, uh, the accident, but uh, I'm not impaired in that sense of the word. Hmm. Uh, or speech impediments, uh, when you're slurring your speech, that's difficult. Uh, but I asked the police this question. You can see that uh, on one of the videos from last year, September, I think it was, when I confront the uh, deputy commissioner about these uh, alcohol and drug testing. And uh, he was a bit bamboozled, I must say. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, um, the upshot is that they, they can test for impairment, but they don't. Mm, okay. They're just, as you say, they're just focused on pre uh, presence. That, that, that's their soul and it's a zero tolerance. And yeah, it, it's... Mm. And, and the reason they've said that is because this is what we have legislated. It's actually enacted in law. And they're, they're being quite police-like. If this is what the law says, this is what you must do, even if it's stupid. Yeah. Um, and what will make them change is if we change the law. It's up to us to do that. Mm. But we don't do that. Why? And I don't get why we don't. It just doesn't make any sense. Well, there's a yeah, certainly a lack of uh, lack of courage, I think, on the part of, of politicians, as you say. They mm. any perceived uh, you know chance of losing votes, but. How then, I mean, you already conceded when discussing the second um, item on the policy agenda, um, the home grow amnesty is sort of how I, I think about that, which is you know akin to the ACT policy. You've conceded that one probably you know, won't get through, but the importance is to actually go to the task of you know, drafting 
a suitable bill so that that can be a blueprint effectively for another state or territory or perhaps um, being reintroduced a year, you know, a few years later in, in WA. Is that sort of the thinking there? Well, exactly. I mean, we're setting this from the upper house and the limitations for that is that we're not allowed to raise revenue. So the tax models, we can't put into that. So it mm. has to really come from the assembly. Uh, but we've got no members in the assembly. We've got no, no power there. So uh, this is one reason why the law is probably not going to be sufficient. It's a model and we could use that, but it has to be tweaked. I think and that that'll be the next iteration, the iteration after that. Mm. Uh, but someone somewhere has to make that start. And uh, we've got a number of people working on this in different states. And uh, at some stage, we've got to, to come together and say, this is what is sensible. The, the, the concept of, of recreational cannabis is a bad thing. They are not going to do that. Guys, get over it. Yeah. This is happening in the world. It's going to happen. 10% of the population now is using cannabis on a regular basis. Does mm -hmm. that mean that 10% of us are criminals? Um, I think uh, over 50% have used cannabis at some stage in life. Are we all, are we, is the majority of our population a criminal? By mm -hmm. law, so. by law, yeah. <laughs> I yes. mean, I mean, but you could say the same thing, right, about, um, you know, I was, we were talking about Thailand earlier, but their, their neighbor, Singapore, or almost neighbor, uh, whilst they're legalizing, Singapore's literally uh, taking people to, putting people to death for, for, for you know, having a small amount of cannabis, essentially. Indeed, and mentally impaired people as well. I mean, it's, yeah. the, the whole thing is just really, really, uh, um, yeah, let's call it evil. So, so what, what do you think the, the, the true level of support amongst your average Australian is? So if we were to do, for example, what they did in New Zealand and hold a referendum, where do you think that would land? I mean, obviously it didn't get passed in New Zealand, but it was something like 51 to 49% or something very, very slim. Do well, you think the last... Yeah. The, the last uh, review I saw suggested that 58% of the population would support decriminalization. Mm. Now, the, the trouble with a referendum is that uh, the parties who are against it are going to use what they do so very often. Let's put the fear factor in. If we allow cannabis to be made uh, the, the decriminalized, you are going to have more crime. You're going to face psychotic people outside your door with an ax who are going to rape your children uh, because they've been uh, exposed to this. Uh, and what's more, it's being fed by the fundamentalist Christians who right now are putting out information which is completely mm. wrong. They're taking mm. scientific studies, they're cherry picking the data and trying to prove the opposite. For mm. example, that CBD causes cancer, mm. nonsense. But they've put these out as being scientific studies when they're the very opposite. And the, the, these types of campaigns uh, uh, supported by the politicians who are against cannabis for whatever reason, that's going to drive people into the state of fear. And that is what makes the, the referendum so very difficult. Yeah, I believe it were the, um, yeah, the conservative Christian base actually of the right in, in New Zealand that played a, a significant role in, hmm. um, you know, in, in campaigning along those fear lines. And, and yeah, it, it was disappointing because despite all of that campaigning, um, you know, it was such a narrow defeat. Um, so, you know, they, they were right right on the cusp. But I can't think of any other plant that would give you much more of a spiritual experience, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> oh, well. Um... Oh, no, that, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, that's, that's <laughs> not necessarily true. But uh, it, it would potentially help. Let's put it that way. It's, um, I think it's by far the safer medium that when compared to alcohol. And uh, I, would, uh, I would far prefer to be uh, sitting next to someone who's used cannabis than I would sitting next to someone who's used alcohol. Yeah, exist. without a doubt, without a doubt, for sure. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I, I, sorry, just curious about the, I guess the, you talked about how Queensland played a role in, um, mm. you know, assisting with the, the WA election. Um, but what are the national efforts like? Because we, we always learn at federal elections in Australia just how disparate, different parts of the country are to one another as much as we do like to think that uh, you know we're all just one country i mean just so diverse mitch and i were in uh, up in far north queensland last year up in Cata country very different to um inner city latte sipping types that we're used to rubbing shoulders with um <laughs> so I'm just, uh, yeah, interested in your thoughts on, on I guess, the national movement. We mm. have Fiona Patton here in Victoria, where we are obviously um, tirelessly dedicated to campaigning for these great causes of yes. cannabis reform. But, you know, what what is the mood in other states, do you think? 
Well, first of all, Queensland uh, is by far the bigger uh, percentage of percent of prescribers. And in mm -hmm. fact, uh, a lot of my WA patients are going to Queensland to get their prescriptions because it's, right. it's far better. The WA regulations are stupid. They're idiotic. Yeah, but this is what we have. Mm -hmm. And we're fighting against that. But look, the, 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 we're actually being run, I think, by fundamentalist Christians in the Department of Health, which is why I think we've got these laws. But, uh, Queen mm. but Queensland itself is, is a, a lot more relaxed in these things. And the, 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 the figures in the federal election were actually astonishing. Very pleased to see that. Mm. Um, but they've also got issues there with being just a unicameral um, uh, state. Uh, so getting you the first past the post is really very difficult. Mm. Anyhow, so when it comes to, to that for state elections, federal elections, uh, it's a beautiful result there. Um, and the momentum, I think, is growing. Other places like ACT, no one gave a shit because cannabis is decriminalized there or, or mm. semi-legalized. And why vote for a legalized cannabis party? Yeah. Because they're not seeing the bigger picture about what we're actually doing. So they're, they're still going the, the, the oppositional um, um, left, right, or the Greens. Um, if you look at New South Wales and Victoria, now Victoria, uh, I have a, a bit of a problem there because I very, very much support Fiona Patton. At the same time, I also very much support legalized cannabis in Victoria. Who, how am I going to work there? Well, the answer is I'll support both. <laughs> <laughs> I both. Because I think Fiona Patton does an awesome job and I really want to make sure that she continues because she has done what uh, I would just dream of doing, mm. uh, the, the power she's got there. Uh, New South Wales, it's a bit tricky there, isn't it? Uh, with with the, the disparate communities in Sydney, particularly, uh, with the, the differing views. But yes, you, you're right. There, there are very different um, uh, uh, acceptances. Northern Territory, for example, very different again to, to uh, Victoria, as mm -hmm. you'd expect. I, I imagine uh, the legalised cocaine party would do quite well in Sydney. But um, yeah, unfortunately, still waiting to, to see the, uh, the cannabis movement really take off in that state. Well, but you know, of course, the, 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 the Portugal experiment, yes. where they decriminalize all drugs. And what happened? The very opposite of what people predicted. Drugs mm -hmm. go, crimes go down, alcoholism goes down, deaths go down, society improves, uh, the tax revenue increases. Like, goodness sakes, why, why don't we do that? It's, it's been proven. Yeah. And credit where credit's due, the, uh, there was New South Wales, I think, uh, end of the... 20th century just yeah you know 20 odd years ago that that introduced the first safe injecting room obviously Fiona yes. Patton has, has followed suit here in, in Victoria yes. which has been a yeah a really um political hot topic actually but Melbourne. also also a lifesaver yes yeah. absolutely yeah harm reduction it's 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 incredible but um yeah still a few angry residents living well, you nearby. see we like to criminalize uh, illicit drugs. What we ought to do is medicalize them. Once we medicalize, we can get a whole different perspective on how to manage these things because people who are ad addicted to drugs are not choosing to be drug addicts. They're actually treating their trauma mostly. Mm. So, so instead of actually criminalizing them and making the trauma worse, why don't we say, guys, you need help, let us help. And yeah. then things like MDMA, for example, could be used very well for PTSD. Mm. Uh, LSD, microdosed, fantastic. Psilocybin for your depression, wonderful. What about also ensuring you're not going to be traumatized further by allowing domestic violence to occur because the VROs don't work? Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Let's, let, let's, let's try get some common sense. Mm. No, it's, yeah, absolutely. And I, I have to say, uh, following both yourself and um, and your colleague, Sophia, on, on Twitter, there is... Uh, possibly an oversupply of common sense um, from your two <laughs> Twitter profiles combined. But uh, yeah, it's quite refreshing. It's, it's, uh, it's just what we need. Um, well, yeah, Brian, I don't know if you had any more questions, Mitch, have you got any, any queries? I think you're going to say about Brian's questions for us. I think no. It's <laughs> <the other one. laughs> um, no, I, I guess the, the only commentary I would have said is around, you know, thinking about politicians that aren't seeing the benefits and kind of ref refusing to do the right thing. Um, surely there'd be some kind of incentive from at least a tax perspective on what, what cannabis might be able to pr provide for us, especially thinking about a post COVID era where we've got, you know, incredible debt and, and, and a lot of bills to pay. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, interesting there, because I think in WA, we're actually uh, in an autocratic dictatorship situation uh, where power is being controlled in the hands of a very few. And once that happens, letting go of that power is actually a big ask. Mm. Um, moving on from that, um, the, what I would like to do uh, is to uh, encourage 
anger in the population. I like pitchforks and flames, not to the <laughs> point of causing damage, but I want people to, to recognize what's going on and get justified anger. This is not right. Much like the voluntary assisted dying, much like the gay marriage. Mm. We need to get people actually doing something rather than bitching about it privately. Do something, say something, tell your politicians, vote for someone else. Okay, yeah. make it very, very clear. This is not acceptable. The pitchforks and the flames ought to be out there. And the, for the government side, I really want to make it very clear from a business point of view, how many hundreds of, of millions of dollars or billions, in fact, can we uh, get to our society? How much tax money can we make? How many more hospitals can we afford? Special care baby units. So the, so the politicians can then say, of course, it's a great idea. The pitchforks and the flames, oh, we, no, we haven't paid attention to that. Of course they have, but no, no, this is because it's the right thing to do. And this is mirroring what Mark McGowan said back in 2003. We're doing it because it is the right thing to do. Hmm. This has to come across. It's the right thing to do. So stop doing something else. Yeah. Do the right thing. Well, it, and it's, um, it, it's also interesting just because WA... I, as a as a state economy is is you know I suppose similar in some respects to Queensland you know with energy and resources but there's this fantastic opportunity um, you know and, and yeah I, I just uh, I, I really would love to see them begin to to turn the tap down on on all of the LNG exports that are that are heading off shore and it, it's it's you know, it really is time to at least begin that process of, of pivoting towards, um, you know, new uh, new sources of revenue, really. And it, it's, yes. it's it beggars belief why they, I mean, it, it, surely some of your colleagues in parliament, even, you know, on the Labor side, understand that energy and resources is, is a finite game. Do you think that that um, there is any degree of planning towards a newer economy um, of the future? Well, credit where credit is due. The Labour Party here in WA uh, is looking towards the future and looking to renewable energy as a source. But the problem we've got is that uh, when I'm speaking in the chamber, I know a lot of the Labour Party members actually agree with me. But because they've got this caucus system, once they've thrashed it out behind closed doors, once they've come to a decision, even if you don't agree with it, you stand solidly behind it. There's good discipline there. And so this is the problem we've got here is that at the moment, the caucus is in this particular direction and we can't shift that because otherwise, if we have people splintering, the party will basically have a crisis and they don't want that. So I, I understand where they're coming from. Just it, it doesn't help truth. It doesn't help justice. Um, but I can see why they're doing it. And it's a sensible thing to do. Um, mm. If we had more balanced power there, we could have a, a discussion between the, the, all the different parts, the way it used to be, you know, the behind the chair discussions, uh, let's see what the people need, and then we can agree on that. So when we come into the chamber, the decisions we're going to make have been decided already, rather than actually uh, this one side, yeah, we're right and you're all wrong all the time. Yeah, that, 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 that sort of um, removal of the, the review function that, that, the, that, that the council is supposed to serve of all the the bills that come from the assembly i that's i hadn't appreciated it was a, an absolute majority in, in both houses but that's mm. um, yeah it, it's it's not uh, not an ideal scenario so we'll, we'll see what happens there, there might there might well be a a teal wave coming coming out west um at the next state election well we had the teal wave of course with the federal but the state election what i really want to do and i'm being very very biased about this what i want is actually a cannabis wave yeah. Because I think we encompass a lot of what the teal uh, objectives are. Yeah, agree. Um, they've they've sort of they've thrown a bit of blue in there for no good reason. It just let that be a green wave and um, <laughs> right behind me. Yeah, exactly. That is, I don't know for anyone listening on the podcast. Um, Brian has the Eureka flag, but um, he's replaced the navy blue with green, and I have to say it's a it's a bit of an improvement on the um, original one that was flying at Eureka <laughs> Stockade, but. Uh, well, unless uh, you had any more queries, Mitch, we might wrap up because we know how busy you are, Brian. But it's it it um, it has been an absolute pleasure to um, to really unpack uh, everything that you're doing. Um, we massively support it, um, and we we really really hope that that there is uh, you know some very sensible legislative reform to come in the um, in the years ahead I know there's at least three more years that you and Sophia have which um, you know makes me very happy so I um, yeah wish you both the best and uh, yeah we'll we'll have to do this again sometime soon 
Well, listen, uh, as a parting word here, this will happen. This mm. is inevitable. It must happen. It will happen. It is coming. So never fear. It will happen. And I must thank all of you as well for all, of, all that you're doing. More power to you. Let's keep on working together as a family. Let's make this happen quicker. Absolutely. We're in. Absolutely. All in. Um, thank you so much, Brian. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have to catch up for a whiskey if we're over in, uh, in WA at some point. Oh. Uh, <laughs> or, or, or whatever else is uh, legalized by that yeah. time <laughs> or, or not as the case may be <laughs> yes exactly all right take care brian we'll uh, beautiful thanks brian stay safe Cheers. love you all bye, bye.